Liquid aerations are scams. I'm going to tell you exactly why. And hopefully by the end of the video, you'll be able to go to your garage and find your liquid aeration product and realize just how bad it got handed to you. All right, so before we get into the meat and potatoes of this video, I think it's important that we go ahead and establish a baseline for what is aeration. And simply put, aeration is a cultural practice where you are quote unquote cultivating the soil, where you are actually opening holes. And by opening the holes in the soil, you get three main objectives completed. Number one, you increase gas exchange. This is the ability for CO2 to leave the soil and the ability for O2 to enter the soil. Number two, you're going to increase water infiltration. This can be very important, especially we know coming out of hot, dry periods that ultimately soils can become hydrophobic and resist the infiltration of water. So coming in, plugging the ground with either a solitine or a holotine aerator is going to create space to, uh, for water to infiltrate. And number three, decrease bulk density, meaning literally we know density is mass over volume, right? So if we decrease the amount of mass occupied by the soil over a given volume, that would ultimately decrease density. So now that we have this piece figured out, let's kind of take a look at you know, how can we do it? I mentioned solid time and I also mentioned hollow time. Hollow time is probably what everybody is most familiar with. This is when you actually pull a core of soil from the ground. So as you move across the soil with your aerator, you're pulling up all these uh, plugs, so to speak, that look a bit like, like goose droppings or something. Then second of all, we have solid tine, meaning that's where we're taking a spike and spiking holes into the soil as we go. Now for residential lawn settings, a solid tine is not going to be a good fit. In this specific instance, we are forcing holes into native soil most of the time in a home lawn setting. Forcing holes into native soil, say particularly high in loam or clay content, can actually increase compaction. Though we may increase gas exchange, though we may temporarily increase infiltration, we're actually creating a problem with the bulk density of the soil. However, solid time on sand-based systems, particularly in uh, like sports turf examples, so golf greens or even outfields, baseball fields, or uh, even football fields, Adopting a solid tine spike on a sand-based system, you're not actually increasing the bulk density of the soil, you're not actually increasing compaction, rather you are in between major cultivation practices creating infiltration points and allowing for gas exchange. So in today's video, we're not going to talk about whether or not you should even aerate, that's a completely separate video. But what we are going to talk about today is specifically, can a liquid aeration product actually aerify the soil? So to kickstart this whole thing, let's just go ahead and throw gasoline on the fire and throw a monkey wrench in the equation. And let's discuss exactly what University of Colorado Extension Agent put out because they were receiving lots of inquiries from the local community there. And I quote, a growing number of web-based businesses as well as lawn care companies are promoting liquid lawn aeration. A typical claim is that conventional aeration or core cultivation where plugs of soil are pulled from the lawn can be replaced by a product sprayed on the lawn. It should be noted that these products should not be confused with high pressure water injection systems used for coreless aerification on golf greens. It is possible 
that some lawn care companies might offer this highly effective but expensive type of aerification, that being the water injection system, as an alternative to conventional core pooling. Companies selling these products may insist that their aeration tool effectively loosens compacted soils, aggregates sandy soils, and generally enhances water retention and turf root growth. While it is difficult to ascertain what is contained in these products, a few have shown to contain liquid humates, essentially liquid organic matter, and soap-like materials such as sodium lauryl or lauryl sulfate. It is simply wishful thinking to believe that a highly diluted solution of either of these applied to a compacted soil will in any effect soil bulk density. There is no indication that any of these products has ever been scientifically evaluated for effectiveness. Simply stated, there is no chemical substitute for physical remediation of soil compaction, namely the traditional core cultivation techniques that have been used for years on all types of turf areas. At best, these wonder products might provide some minor degree of wetting agent effect and nothing more. Wetting agents increase spreading and penetration of liquids across surfaces and into or throughout surfaces. All right, so these are pretty harsh criticisms from University of Colorado. And I think the good point is made there. Can a liquid applied product actually decrease soil bulk density? So let's review what University of Colorado said and take a look at these few products and try to get an understanding of what is actually in them. Then at the end, we can make the determination whether or not based on existing data, the active ingredients in these products actually decrease soil bulk density. All right, so product number one we're going to look at is Covington Naturals. Uh, I searched lawn aerator, liquid lawn aerifier on the old interwebs and came across this one, saw YouTube on it, and pretty much confirmed everything that you hear about every other liquid aeration product. When we take a look at the label to understand exactly what's in this product, we see it contains naturally occurring microbes, it contains molasses, it contains humates, and it contains kelp. Now, on the surface, when I look at this, I can tell you that there is nothing in this that can actually aerify the soil. It may or may not contain a surfactant. It was not stated on the label, nor was it stated in the SDS. However, the big thing that throws a red flag to me right here is that it contains microbes and molasses and humates. Molasses and humates can provide a carbon source, thus a food source for microbes. If microbes are in the presence of molasses and humates, the microbes will feed on these and reproduce. The microbe bloom in this container would become so extreme that they would proliferate, then cannibalize, then die very quickly. So from life to death, this product may last on the shelf possibly a week at the most. So I highly doubt this is actually what's in the container. It might contain microbes, but they certainly are not alive. Product number two is Soil Soft. I saw this one on a YouTube video and I tried to look up the label of this product and there's not a label anywhere. And what I actually found was a picture of the container and analyzing the container, there was still no listing of the ingredients on the package. That is highly illegal. However, I did watch this TikTok YouTube expert talk about what was in this product and what to expect from it. One of the first things they stated is that unlike other liquid aeration products, this product is not a soap. Many of the liquid aerators on the market are nothing more than just soap and water, but you want more than that. However, what they demonstrated it was, what they demonstrated was, it was indeed a surfactant and it contained humates and it contained kelp. So as University of Colorado suggested, this product actually contains all three of the same things they said did not make a liquid aeration product. And like this YouTube, YouTube expert claimed, they said it's not soap, but does contain a surfactant. And as we all know, soaps are actually surfactants. Product number three is the Lawn Star liquid air fire soil something or another. 
And according to the SDS, the way this is labeled, it is labeled as a surfactant. And it actually contains an anionic surfactant. The specific surfactant contained is alkyl ether sulfate. This is actually a quality surfactant. That's a good surfactant. Uh, so as a wetting agent, this is a very legitimate product. And one thing I noticed that kind of threw me for a loop was the label, the specific verbiage on this label actually matched the specific verbiage on this Covington Naturals label. So it leads me to believe if I had to guess, either Lawn Star manufactures the product for Covington Naturals or whoever manufactures the product for both of them is a singular company. Specifically, the words that were noted on here, let me check my notes real quick, was for best results apply Lawn Star liquid soil aerator before 10 p.m. or after 5 p.m. This allows for decreased evaporation and greater efficacy. Application during the afternoon should be avoided. And if we check the coming to naturals one, it says for best results apply before 10 a.m. This allows for decreased evaporation and greater efficacy. Applications during the afternoon should be avoided. Odd, it's too similar. You never see that warning on a label really anywhere, especially with the same exact wording and sentence structure. So that tells me likely these have the same manufacturer. All right, the next product we're going to look at is the Simple Lawn Solutions Soil Loosener Soil Aerifier. Uh, I could not find a label or an SDS, but I phoned a friend on this one and he told me that the active ingredient in this material is ammonium lauryl sulfate or ammonium lauryl sulfate. And what that tells me is that specific active ingredient is an anionic surfactant. This is a good, legitimate surfactant. As a wetting agent, this is a very valid product. Now we'll talk about Air 8. Air 8 consists of humic acid and potassium hydroxide. What we have run into with this type of product is a saponification reaction. Simply put, saponification reactions produce anionic soaps or surfactants, we can interchange those words and they work pretty much the same way. This is a soap reaction, saponification is. And basically the science behind that reaction is, and I'm simplifying this pretty extremely here, you take a lipid and you react it with a very alkaline material like potassium hydroxide. And then normally if you were producing a soap, you would add an alcohol. So if you were producing a bar of soap, you would probably use something like isopropyl alcohol, bake it off, and you would be left with a bar of soap. If you were making a liquid soap, you would use a synthetic alcohol like glycerin, which would hold everything and give you that consistent liquid soap kind of feel. This product, since we are not obviously anything on the label about alcohol, what we're dealing with is just a liquid that's been reacted with an alkaline substance. We're dealing with a crude soap. Now, the big puzzle piece is, where do the lipids come from? The lipids actually come from lignite or linardite, the source material where the humic acid is extracted. Lignite, according to this study, uh, the yields and elemental analysis, the lipid extraction yields and elemental analyses obtained from lignite range from one to 9%, depending on where the material was mined. So we know that the lipid content is actually coming from the lignite, which is the source material for the humic acid. And the reason why you see higher lipid content in there is that lignite is the final stage of plant breakdown before it turns into coal, right? And the very last thing to break down in a plant is going to be the lipid content. Lipids take an extremely long time to break down. So therefore, that's why you see such higher lipid content and thus are able to perform a saponification reaction. So we have excess alkalinity plus a liquid is saponification, AKA it is a crude soap. If you would like a pro tip, one of the things you can do is Google a potassium humate soap and you'll see bars of soap and different stuff that exists out there as a potassium humate soap. That is just a finished off saponification reaction with an alcohol 
that is baked off. So I've done a little digging and because we went ahead and deduced that all of the liquid aeration products we were working with were some sort of either non-ionic or anionic surfactant or even a polymer of some sort, I went ahead and looked for studies that pertain specifically to those soil surfactants and how they interacted with the soil, specifically on the water level and the gas exchange level. So this is what I came up with. In the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation, this specific study looked at these four types of soil surfactants. We had a non-ionic surfactant, we had an anionic surfactant, we had a block polymer and we had a co-block polymer that were tested. What the test ended up showing in this trial was we had great H2O infiltration. In fact, it said water infiltration and distribution of water as it moved to the soil matrix showed positive results. However, the one big piece that was not uncovered was that there was actually no increase in water holding capacity of the soil. While it may work towards infiltrating water more effectively, more uniformly across a wider area, there was actually no increase in water holding capacity. And the reason why there was no increase in water holding capacity had to do with the fact that the density of the soil was not altered. So because there was no water holding capacity increase observed, it could be deduced that the bulk density of the soil also was not altered in any form or fashion. Then on the other piece of this, while monitored for gas exchange, the non-ionic surfactant actually decreased the exchange of oxygen in the soil. While an anionic surfactant had potential to increase oxygen exchange in the soil, however, what was observed is that it only began at extremely high rates and those rates were exceeding 100 gallons per acre. So really the only piece of the puzzle we had left to establish was did humates actually manipulate the bulk density of the soil? And I was unable to uncover any specific studies that dealt with applications of humic acid in normal application rates altering the bulk density of the soil. Where you did find that was when applications were made at 5, 10, 15, 25 tons an acre in a similar effect that you see like biochar. Straight humic acid may have a low bulk density when applied to a higher bulk density of soil, just the sheer volume of material. But in terms of actual applications decreasing bulk density of the soil, it didn't exist. So in conclusion, if we look at aeration as three specific positives, increase in gas exchange, increase in water infiltration, and decrease in bulk density. Unfortunately, liquid aeration products only meet the demands of one of these categories. Then what becomes arguable is which one lasts longer. We know that soil surfactants are only going to be available and able to perform work between a time period of one upwards of four weeks depending on the type of product you use. We know that in aeration, the holes are going to last for a given period of time unless you backfill those holes with something to maintain that extra porosity like with sand. Then you can get increased time frames of infiltration. Realistically, a month at about the max would be as long as you would get infiltration increases from a mechanical aeration. So there, I would consider it a bit of a moot point, a wash. Now, in terms of actually decreasing bulk density of the soil, and in terms of actually increasing the gas exchange of the soil, now that piece is significantly different. With mechanical aeration, specifically a hollow tine mechanical aeration, specifically in native soil, well, the choice is clear. Only one can perform all three of these tasks. That is a mechanical aeration, and therefore, liquid aeration is a scam. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this video. Feel free, leave all the hate in the comments down below. Uh, I'm willing to explore this in a very open and honest dialogue with whoever wants to have the conversation. Uh, in the meantime, I've got more videos like this one using the whiteboard on the agenda. So, 
Tell me if you enjoyed this video, hit the subscribe button and hope to see you next time.